Hello, and welcome to our third and final topic as we consider plants at the organismal level. Remember that in our first lecture on this topic, we talked about the structure of plants, including their organs, their tissue systems, and their cells. We then thought about how these various structures developed. And finally, we're going to think about what is going to happen internally in this organism. And remember, this is all part of our big picture in terms of how we try to figure out how plants solve the problems of being multicellular organisms. And so at the developmental level, we tended to think about how plants solve the problems of acquiring resources. In fact, how they developed, how they grew uh, to go after resources such as light, water, etc. But now we're going to think about how plants solve the problem of maintaining an internal environment physiologically. And as we think about the problems of maintaining an internal environment, there are several challenges that all multicellular organisms face. And we're not going to have time to think about all of them, but we can think about a couple of really important ones. So the first one we're going to consider is how organisms, particularly plants, circulate resources such as nutrients and water through their uh, multicellular bodies. Because all organisms, whether you're a plant, you're a fungus, you're an animal, have to circulate certain compounds through a large multicellular body to move compounds from a, an exterior to some sort of interior and back again. And the second topic we're going to explore is how uh, these organisms, how plants, exchange gases with the environment. Again, remember that all multicellular organisms need to exchange gases with the environment. As animals, we need to release carbon dioxide and take in oxygen. Um, fungi are somewhat similar. Um, plants, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, they need carbon dioxide, certainly, um, but they also need oxygen in more limited quantities. So they're going to have to exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen, but in quantities that work both for photosynthesis and for respiration. In this first part of our physiology lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about the movement or circulation of uh, nutrients and water uh, throughout the organism of a plant. And first, we'll talk about transport through xylem. And this is in section 36 of your t uh, chapter 36 of your textbook, uh, sections three to four. And then we're going to talk about translocations. So this would be the movement of carbohydrates through the phloem. And this is talked about in chapter 36.5. As we think about circulation, the term itself makes a lot of sense for animals. Because in fact, everything in an animal body is being moved throughout the entire body of the organism in a somewhat circular pattern. For plants, the term circulation makes a little bit less sense because uh, things are often not being completely circulated in an entire loop. And so it makes sense to talk about, to break this process of circulation into a couple of components. So the first component is going to be transport. And the idea behind transport is we're going to move things up, particularly water and nutrients from the soil. So we're going to move our water and our mineral nutrients up to the soil, um, start at, we're going to, starting in the roots, going to the stems, and eventually getting into the leaves. And so this is primarily what's going to happen in the xylem. On the other hand, we need to move carbohydrates um, from the leaves to other parts of the plant. And so this is primarily going to be a process of moving things down, but of course not always, which is why in this textbook figure it shows arrows going both ways. But as our leaves are photosynthesizing, most of our carbohydrates are going to be moved down to the stem and into the roots, or into the developing fruits or other structures that might occur uh, in the branches. Let's begin with the process of transport. And we'll break the process of transport down into several different components. So we'll start in the soil and go first to the roots, and then from the roots we'll go to the rest of the organism. To get you oriented, uh, here is a root cross-section. And the root cross-section is fairly close to the root tip, so we have little root hairs, and a lot of our absorption is going to happen to the root hairs. We then have this cortex of ground tissue right here, so these would be larger cells, uh, often used in uh, storage of starches or uh, other compounds. And we have to move through this cortex to eventually get to this central part over here, which is the vascular column. And so in many roots, um, particularly uh, dicot roots, the vascular column is the central part over here, and it consists of xylem and phloem. In this case, we're not going to have a pith, but other roots like uh, monocot roots might have a pith. So this is the journey that we have to make from the 
the soil into uh, the center of the root. The first thing that has to happen is absorption. And this can certainly happen through root hairs. Remember that root hairs are epidermal cells. They're living cells. And so they're very good at absorbing water and absorbing uh, minerals from the soil. But plants also have other ways of absorbing uh, water and minerals from the soil. And that is through uh, mycorrhizae. And so mycorrhizae are particularly good at bringing in uh, mineral nutrients such as, as nitrogen. So we'll talk more about mycorrhizae in our next set of lectures about the fungi. But uh, mycorrhizae are uh, a, a fungal relationship uh, between um, a, a particular uh, set of fungi and uh, the plant. So the fungus uh, is depicted right here. And it will grow in the soil. You can see that it's very narrow. And it's uh, excellent at absorbing water. It's excellent also at taking in nitrogen. The fungus then will grow into the cells of the plant. And we have one cell layer here. But you know, the, the, um, you know most uh, mycorrhizal fungi can grow well into the cortex. And so they'll bring what they absorb, their water, their nitrogen, into the cells, in fact, into the cytoplasm of the cells. And they'll release this to the cells, but there's a reason that they're doing this. And the reason that they're doing it is that the plant cell in return is uh, giving carbohydrates to the fungus. So the fungus is actually getting paid for or fed for its work. Uh, through either of these mechanisms, uh, we get water into the root hair of a cell, right? And into the cortex. So that's what we're starting to see right here, right? So you can come in uh, either through the root hair absorbing directly or through some sort of mycorrhizal interaction. Once water is into the cortex, there are a couple of ways that it can make it through the cortex. So the first way is uh, apoplastically. If you remember, uh, a plant cell is going to have both a cell wall and it's going to have uh, a plasma membrane, as I've shown right here. So here would be the cell wall, and here's the plasma membrane just inside. So Water that comes into a root hair can move apoplastically between the membrane and the cell wall. So you can see this apoplastic movement taking place through the root hair, through the epidermis, into the cortex. Water can also move symplastically. And so the idea behind symplastic movement is that water goes not just into the cell wall, but also through this, this uh, plasma membrane, the cell membrane, into the cytoplasm of the cell. And once it's inside the cytoplasm of the cell, it can move actually from cell to cell through these structures that we call plasmodesmata. In plant cells, what happens is that cells are actually connected via the plasmodesmata. In fact, the cytoplasm is connected via the plasmodesmata. So the membrane of one cell can go through a little opening between the cell walls right here and continue into the next cell. So if water is in one cell, it can move through this opening, this plasmodesma, that's the singular, uh, and just sort of keep going symplastically all the way from cell to cell through the root hairs, whoops, I'm sorry, the blue line, through the root hairs, uh, through the cortex, and eventually to our vascular column. Once water arrives at the vascular column, then uh, there is a reckoning, so to speak. And while movement thus far can be both apoplastic and symplastic, in order for water to get into this vascular column, it must do it symplastically. What forces the water to go in symplastically is the structure that we call the Casparian strip. So this layer of cells here is the endodermis, right? Noting the, the boundary between the cortex and the vascular column, the phloem cells and the xylem cells. And we can see our Casparian strip in a little bit more detail over here. So this is the endodermis again. You can see these little plasmodesmata right here leading into the endodermis. But then this Casparian strip is this sort of waxy suberin substance that forms a barrier um, between the cell membrane and the cell walls of cells. And you can see it in all of our cells over here. In fact, it forms an entire band around the membrane, as you can see in, in this particular image right here. Any water that's moving apoplastically eventually hits this Casparian strip, and it can't go any further. 
if it's going to progress, this water either has to stop or move through the plasma membrane into uh, the endodermis, and then eventually, of course, into the vascular cylinder. The reason that this is significant is that this is sort of the plant's regulation mechanism. If water moves through the cell wall into the root hair, the cell wall is really inert. Uh, it's not making any sort of decision, quote unquote, about what gets in, right? Anything that can diffuse across this membrane gets in. Water gets in, um, nutrients get in, that's good. Toxins get in, can get in, pathogens can get in, lots of things can get in through this somewhat inert cell wall over here. However, um, while we want some of this, like the water, the mineral nutrients, to keep going in our vascular column, we don't want everything to keep going, right? We don't want potential toxins, we don't want potential pathogens um, to make it into the rest of the plant body. And so this Casparian strip sort of acts like this grand gatekeeper here, you know, sitting there, arms crossed, um, at the, the boundary between the cortex and the vascular column. Because once uh, something has made it into the vascular column, as we're about to see from there, it's going to get moved into the rest of the plant. It's going to get moved up. And so any attempt at limiting what gets moved up has to occur uh, right here at this, uh, right here at the endodermis, right? And has to be blocked by the Casparian strip. Finally, once water makes it into our vascular column, particularly once it makes into the xylem cells, and you can see the big xylem cells right here with water and blue accumulating in them, then water can be moved into the rest of the plant. Therefore, our next step in transport is the movement of water from roots into the shoots. And there are a couple of ways that plants can do this. The first is that they can push the water up, and the second way is they can pull the water up. So we'll start with the push over here. And to push water up, uh, what actually has to happen is that we need ions to get pumped into the xylem cells of our vascular column. So this is a form of active transport. And as you might remember from an earlier class, such as Bio 111 or Bio 212, uh, active transport is the process of using energy, using ATP, move something against a concentration gradient and sort of really to accumulate a very high concentration of something inside cells. So ions, and there are a variety of ions that can be used in this uh, situation, could get pumped into xylem cells via active transport. Now, once ions are pumped into the cells over here, what that means is that water is going to get moved in via diffusion by a passive transport, and we call the passive transport of water osmosis. So now that we have a high concentration of ions moved in by active transport, water is going to osmose in uh, at a very high rate. And as water osmoses in, this creates a lot of pressure in these cells, a lot of high water pressure. And this high water pressure um, has nowhere else to go but up, and so this water is pushed up. And we call that process gutation. So this is what it would look like uh, if you could actually see a plant doing that. So here we have some uh, little plant leaves over here of what looks like uh, maybe a, a strawberry plant. And notice the little um, sort of jagged edges over here. And at the tips of these jagged edges are little water molecules. And so these water molecules are actually being forced out of the leaf because the pressure inside the roots the water pressure inside the roots created by these ion concentrations, high ion concentrations, is so great that it's pushing water through the roots, through the stems, into the leaves, and eventually out the leaves. One interesting note about gutation is that you're much more likely to see gutation early in the morning than you are in the afternoon. And there's a good reason for this, because in the afternoon, what plants are going to be able to do is use the energy of sun, as we're going to see in a second, uh, to actually pull the water up via transpiration. But early in the morning, um, if the sun is not shining particularly brightly, if there's not a lot of heat, um, this energy to pull water up is not available. Therefore, water has to be pushed up, and so it's going to be pushed up via this process of gutation. To see what this actually looks like in real time, I found a little YouTube clip of gutation, so let me show you gutation. The following video occurs in real time, so there's a lot of water, as you're about to see, that's actually getting pushed out of the tip of this leaf by gutation. 
first drop is going to fall off. Look how quickly a second drop is forming. It's going to fall off. Here's a third drop. So there's a lot of water that's getting moved up a plant in a really short period of time. An alternative to pushing water up through cutation is to pull water up through the process of transpiration. And this is certainly preferable because instead of requiring energy on the part of the plant to pump ions into the roots and then bring water in via osmosis for, for this push, we're going to rely on the energy of sun, particularly evaporation, to create a vacuum that's going to pull water up. So let's start uh, at the top of a tree over here. And what's going to happen uh, as the sun uh, gets warmer over the course of the day is that water that is, are, is in the cell of leaves are going to evaporate. So here we see a leaf right here. Here's its endodermis on either side. I'm sorry, the epidermis on either side. We have a vascular column in the middle. And then we have cells of the mesophyll right here. And this would be a little stomata, our opening on the underside of a leaf. So as the water warms inside the mesophyll, uh, little water molecules are going to uh, expand. They're going to exit the uh, stomata. And as they exit the stomata, this is going to create an area of low pressure, particularly an area of low pressure in the leaf and in the uh, vascular column right here in the xylem. So in fact, this low pressure can be quite significant, like uh, 100 millipascals less than the outside air. We've got a vacuum up here. And now that we have a vacuum in the leaves, what can happen is we can start to pull water through the xylem. So that's what we see in this next diagram right here. So these are a variety of xylem cells, and these look to me to be more like vessel elements. Um, so they're moving uh, between uh, these perforated plates of cell from cell to cell. So in these xylem cells, there are a couple of things that are happening. The first is that water molecules, which are illustrated right here, are binding to each other via hydrogen bonds. And so this is our process of cohesion. So we're creating these uh, lots of cohesive bonds that sort of keep uh, our water held together. Uh, another thing that's happening is that water molecules um, are binding sort of to the sides of xylem cells through the process of adhesion. And so um, our water molecules are not slipping down, um, but they're sort of being held in the cells as they're slowly pulled up. So this cohesion-adhesion process is giving us uh, a water column that extends all the way from the roots through the stems, through the branches, uh, into the leaves, and into the veins, of the leaves. Finally, if we come all the way down here to the roots, and so this is a little blown up picture of what's happening at the tips of a root, we have much higher pressure in the soil, and the water and the air around the soil, than we do in uh, our vascular column at the tips of leaves. And so this high pressure area here results basically in water being pushed into the roots through uh, into the root hairs, through the cortex, and into the vascular column of the roots. And so water is being pushed all the way from the roots into the stem up the plant. So transpiration, this process of evaporation that occurs at the leaves, is creating the necessary pressure differential for water to be pushed all the way up the trees, which is really impressive when you think that some of the tallest trees in the world are uh, close to 200 feet tall. So this system works very well, but of course there's always a potential problem. And that potential problem is the problem of cavitation. So what happens if uh, we have a break in our water column somewhere in the xylem cells? And once a, uh, we get a cavitation event, it's very difficult for the plant to refill uh, these xylem cells with water and to sort of recreate this water column. So once a cavitation event occurs, that basically means that the xylem cell is no longer going to be able to, to function in the transport of water. Unfortunately, this is something that can happen for plants on a regular basis, uh, seasonally, particularly during the winter. So during the winter, uh, water can freeze. As it freezes, it expands. 
but then of course in the spring uh, this slightly expanded water is going to melt again and when it melts it's going to create it, it occupies less volume and that occupying of less volume creates cavitation creates breaks in the water column so these breaks in the water column over time accumulate much more uh, in older xylem towards the center of the stem than in younger xylem towards the uh, exterior of the stem. And so that's often why it's only the xylem towards the exterior of the stem that are most uh, useful in transpiration and the movement of water up the stem. Uh, the xylem in the center of the stem is used often for storage of things like toxins that accumulate in the plant, but uh, it doesn't function nearly as well for transpiration. We've now moved water up the stem in the process of transport through the xylem. Now we need to move our phloem in the process of translocation. So we'll start in a leaf and we'll get to the phloem in our first step. And then in our next step, we'll go from the phloem um, of a leaf to phloem throughout the rest of the plant body and eventually to uh, sinks like roots and fruits or other structures that would need a uh, large loads of carbohydrates. Just as movement through the cortex of a root towards the vascular column could be either apoplastic or symplastic, uh, similarly movement through the mesophyll of a leaf can be apoplastic or symplastic as well. So let's begin with a leaf cross section and we have an epidermal layer on top, an epidermal layer below. We have mesophyll cells between our two epidermal layers. So notice that the mesophyll at the top is much more tightly packed so that it can collect light that's coming down on the, the top part of the leaf. Um, our mesophyll cells on the lower part of the leaf are much more loosely packed to allow for gas exchange, um, particularly to allow for uh, carbon dioxide to come in, for oxygen to exit through the stomata. Maybe there's going to be some movement of water vapor as well. And then scattered through these mesophyll cells are going to be our vascular bundles containing xylem cells at the top and phloem cells underneath. So photosynthesis is happening over here in these mesophyll cells. So this would be a, a mesophyll cell right here. And as photosynthesis occurs, uh, carbohydrates build up. Carbohydrates can move symplastically, as we see here, from cell to cell via plasmodesmata. Sometimes some of our carbohydrates may move outside of a membrane and move symplastically. But eventually, they're going to move from mesophyll cells into the phloem cells of a vein. So I've shown two particular phloem cells of a vein here. And you remember that there can be a couple of different types of phloem cells from our discussion of, of cell types. So one type of a phloem cell is a companion cell. So I've brought this figure back from a past lecture. And companion cells are living. So you can see a nucleus over here. They have a plasma membrane. Um, they're very capable of uh, using energy. ATP energy to move things across the membrane, which is going to become important really quickly. Our second type of cell over here is the sieve tube, and the sieve tube lacks a nucleus and it lacks uh, other organelles and many of the other structures that might be in a cytoplasm, but it does have a plasma membrane, as we see right here. And so what will happen is that the companion cells are going to move and really pack carbohydrates into our sieve tube cells. And to do that, of course, the little picture over here indicates that that has to occur via active transport. So this little green molecule might be a carbohydrate. We're moving across a membrane over here to create a high concentration of carbohydrates in the sieve tube cells. And that movement is going to take ATP as an energy source. Once we get carbohydrates into phloem cells of the leaf, the next step is we have to go from phloem cells of the leaf to other organs in the plant. To carbon sinks. This next figure in your textbook shows how that can be done. And the whole process is a process that's known as pressure flow. And it's a really extraordinary process in that there's really only one step of the whole process that requires energy. And that energy then drives the movement throughout the entire system. And this is actually, in a way, a circulatory process. So let's return over here to a leaf. I've drawn a leaf up here. And inside our leaf, remember, we have phloem cells. And we have a companion cell and a sieve cell. So here's a companion cell. And a companion cell has these carbohydrates in it, indicated by these green dots. 
and the companion cell is using active transport, shown with this green arrow right here, to pump lots of carbohydrates into our sieve cell. So this is that first uh, stage of pressure flow that requires energy, that requires active transport. We're going to increase the sugar concentration in sieve tube cells. Once we do this, everything else derives from this very high concentration of carbohydrates in a sieve tube cell. Once we have this high concentration, what that means is that if we have water in other cells, such as this xylem cell that might be very close to the sieve cell, we now drive diffusion of water from an area of a high concentration of water to an area of low concentration of water from the xylem cell into the sieve tube cell. Right, so water is osmosing into the sieve tube cells. As water is osmosing in, this is sort of like gutation, except instead of pushing things up, we're now pushing water down. And so we get this buildup of pressure over here in our phloem sieve tube cell. And so we get this push towards areas of lower pressure in our phloem cells. So this can uh, go down stems, maybe to other branches, or maybe all the way down stems, all the way to roots towards parts of the plant that we refer to as sinks. So in a sink, what's going to happen is that we have less carbohydrate in the sink cells than we might in our sieve cells. So we're going to get the movement of carbohydrates, sometimes by diffusion, sometimes by some active uh, transport, depending on how many carbohydrates we want to push in. But this can go uh, mostly by uh, diffusion if we want. So we're going to get the movement of carbohydrates into our sink over here, whatever this might be, and out of our sieve cells. Remember that water up here osmosed in because we had a high concentration of carbohydrates inside our phloem cells. After we've lowered the concentration of carbohydrates in our phloem cells, water is now going to osmos out of phloem back into the xylem, where there's still a concentration of other um, mineral nutrients that are being moved up. So this is osmosis. This is also a form of passive uh, diffusion. And so as water now passively diffuses back into the xylem cell, again, we create higher pressure in the xylem cells. And this higher pressure in the xylem cells, just as we talked about in gutation, is going to contribute or help to the push of water back up. Right? So we still have uh, transpiration pulling our water up, but we have sort of a push as well, uh, aiding the movement of water back up. And so we create this cycle. And as I said, the neat thing about it is that it's launched or initiated by this single point of active transport from companion cells into sieve tube cells. As a final uh, fun end note, the question uh, that might uh, materialize in your mind is, well, how is all this done? How is all this um, measured? And initially, this whole system was sort of uh, worked out. Many parts of it were worked out. Uh, quite a while ago, before there were sort of very specific um, and very narrow um, syringes that could actually be put into cells. So researchers needed something else to very precisely put a little tube into the cells of phloem, particularly into the phloem cells of leaves, to see where phloem pressure was high. And the way they did that was aphids. So Periodically, you got to admit that animals are useful for something. So here's one of these great moments where animals are actually useful for something, particularly aphids, which usually aren't good for anything. They're just sort of annoying plant pests. So aphids have this long proboscis that they stick into the veins of plants. And what aphids want to do is sort of use the pressure inside the phloem um, to slurp out the, the phloem and, and suck it up for themselves. But if you strategically place aphids at various points on plant leaves um, and even in plant stems, what you can do is um, then you can, uh, hopefully this is not too gruesome, separate the aphid from its proboscis over here with a little snip, and you have the proboscis left um, as a little tube that goes into the flow. So once you have this set up, would sap flow into aphids, would sap flow into aphids be greater near the sugar sources or the sugar sinks. And if you remember from our previous diagram, our highest pressure is going to be over here in the sieve tube cells near the source of the carbon, 
our pressure is going to be lower near the sinks. And so researchers were able to measure where the pressure was highest using the little uh, proboscis of aphids and work out this whole pressure flow system um, in a really uh, simple but elegant way. This is the end of our uh, first physiology lecture on circulation. Uh, our next physiology lecture and our final lecture in our trip to the plants is going to look at gas exchange.